welcome to my channel. This is going to be a August reading wrap up. I read nine books in completeness in August and five more I've read parts of. Uh, three of those were rereads, three of the partial ones, and two were short story collections that I only read some of the short stories in. And one of the books I completed this month, the b -b -b -b, one of the books I completed this month was City of Veils, which I talked about in a whole video just about it. So I'll link that below if you want to know about that one. But other than that, I'm going to start off with the ones I'm most excited about, that I enjoyed the most, and that I want to tell you the most about. So the first one of those is going to be The Language of Thorns. Midnight Tales and Dangerous Magic, which is a short story collection of, I believe, six short stories by Leigh Bardugo. And first of all, do you just absolutely love this cover? And the back cover is also quite enjoyable. And so is it without its dust cover. It's just really amazing. Glorious. This collection is, as it says, it's Midnight Tales and Dangerous Magic. It is basically six tales uh, from both German and Eastern Europe to Russia type uh, inspiration. They're redone fairy tales uh, in expanded form, but not too expanded because they're still short stories, not full length novels. They each have a different take, sometimes often actually on who the bad guy is in each case. And so they're kind of darker tales, some of them. In fact, well the original tales that they're based on were pretty dark, but these are dark in usually a different way. And they're kind of twisted around on their head. As I said, the bad guy is usually a different person than they were in the original story. And the happy ending is a different type of happy ending than you would normally expect, except one of the stories did not have a happy ending at all. But I won't tell you which one, uh, because of spoilers. That particular en ending didn't bother me as much as a usually a unhappy ending would, just because, um, I don't know, the way it was done, it was... It felt like kind of a happy ending, even though it wasn't the normal kind of happy ending. If you read it, you will know what I mean. Uh, one thing that I want to mention that goes for all the stories is the illustrations. As you can see all around the edge here, we have a border of very pretty uh, illustration. And the cool thing is that it grows from the beginning of the story, like the beginning of this story. It was just this little flowers at the top and then each page gets a little bit more. A little more and a little more until you get to the full illustration which is slightly spoilery but not very so I looked at all the illustrations before I read and I still didn't really know what was gonna happen so look away for a second if you don't want to know oops <laughs> that's not it there there's the full illustration for that story it's really cool so, and there are, there's, most of the, the fullest illustrations I wouldn't say are very spoilery. Here's another one. One of them is very spoilery, but I won't show you that one. Um, they're just, oh, they're glorious. Oh, they're glorious. Here's one where they've grown from opposite ends of the page. This one has a, uh... You can see a castle with a maze along the side. That one is a retelling of the Minotaur story with the where the Minotaur is in the labyrinth. Really creative. And I also liked that they were um, stories from, they're ones that you're familiar with most of the time, but not as familiar as we are with Hans Christian Andersen ones, although one of them is. One of them is based on um, Little Mermaid, very vaguely. It's actually a prequel to mermaid type story. Anyway, but most of them are, they're not like Cinderella, Snow White, those uh, ones. There is Hansel and Gretel, kind of. There's a Hansel and Gretel inspired one, but um, the other ones, there's the Minotaur. There's one that I've never actually heard before, which is about a fox who is a clever fox, and he 
uh, escapes from hunters and stuff. So I don't know uh, where that one came from, but it's one I'm unfamiliar with. And then one is about, it's kind of based on the Velveteen Rabbit, apparently. But it was also kind of uh, very nutcrackery. The one with the water lady, I've never heard that story before, although it has some elements that are very, very much something that would happen in old tales. And I am actually really interested in from Eastern Europe into Russia, Russian type fairy tales, like a lot of the ones that are the basis for ballets, like Nutcracker and uh, Firebird, Swan Lake, those kind of things. Uh, I really am interested in those, partially just because they're unknown to me and also because there's a lot of really cool magic involved. And the Firebird, for example, is one that I had read to me in ballet class when I was a very small girl and it uh, just really stuck with me and so it's kind of near to my heart so um, I really like hearing more tales from kind of that area that are different from the standard ones that get a lot of play. Oh and one aspect that uh, is maintained from the origin of the tales into uh, several of these adaptations is the whole repetitive nature of some fairy tales, especially I've been reading online some Russian ones to try to get inspiration for the stories that I'm working on, and a big theme is three or more repetitive things that happen in order that are usually an escalation of each, like something happens like you wish, like uh, there's also a tale about a wishing fish type thing where a fisherman's wife wishes for grander and grander things because his wife is telling him to and uh, eventually they end up in a palace but the wife still isn't happy with that so she has him go back and wish and uh, finally at the last wish the goldfish or wish fish uh, sets everything back to the way it was and in at least two of these tales there is a set of three things that happens one after the other and each one is different from the last but similar and it's kind of an escalation and in the final escalation that is the turning point of the story. So very creative, very fun, very touches your heart a lot because one of the main themes is uh, what this is written on the back which is love speaks in flowers, truth requires thorns and that's kind of talking about how don't ignore the things that are kind of not right. Don't just let things go on and ignore the signs that things are not right. You need to get things out and deal with it. That's better than letting it fester. Even if it makes you uncomfortable, it's much better than just deluding yourself and other people. So I highly recommend The Language of Thorns by Leigh Bardugo, short story collection. And the next thing that I'm extra excited about is look at these. Look at these. Look at these glorious covers and these beautiful colors. They're on my Instagram in their full glory uh, if you want to see them. This is the Fairyland series by Catherine M. Valente and <laughs> I've actually been following Catherine uh, on Twitter for like almost since I got a Twitter because she's a feminist and she's funny. She's very funny. She's witty and a lot of witty feminist stuff, which is stuff that I love. And she's a writer, so I was very interested in what she had to say about a lot of things. And I didn't realize when I picked this one up in my, it, it was in my um, library sale hall because of the really cool cover um, and the cool uh, name, the girl who circumnavigated Fairyland in the ship for her own making sounds, you know, like middle grade fantasy, and it was, and it, it, oh my gosh. Anyway, I didn't realize when I bought it that this was the author that I was, I didn't really look at the author's name and realize I really like her. So <laughs> I didn't pick it up because of that, even though I knew of her before I picked it up. And I just have to say that there is a special sort of joy that comes from liking someone as a person and then finding out that you also like them as an artist or as a as a writer because uh, this this the writing the how she expresses things is just glorious it's the 
The narrator is omniscient and just the way it's narrated is so glorious. I'm gonna read you a little bit. I can, let's see. Papers, the gargoyle thundered. Portress rattled along the earthen walls. Its breath was smoky and hot, and in its mechanical jaw, a steel tongue rattled. September shrank back against the leopard, the force of the gargoyle's breath pushing at her face. Betsy Basilstock, you come out of there this second, the green wind hollered back, though not quite so loud, having no leather bellow lungs to help him along. That's just a little bit that I found on the fly, but it just, the whole thing is written that tightly and that not taking yourself too seriously. As has been said on some of her reviews, it's got a lot of Wizard of Oz vibes and Wonderland, Alice in Wonderland vibes in that everything is crazy and doesn't make sense and doesn't have to make sense, uh, but also much less creepy than either of those because I hated those both when I was a kid. They're creepy. These are not creepy. They're very enjoyable and very creative and crazy and just the best best that fairyland could be. I'm more of an epic fantasy type writer where it, um, although is this epic fantasy? I don't know. Anyway, I like my stuff to make sense, but I like, I definitely enjoy reading this even though it doesn't make sense. There's a lot of stuff like, uh, things that are bigger on the inside than the outside. That kind of doesn't make sense. Not doesn't make sense with the rules that it's established. She does a good job of that. It's like having crazy rules. Doctor Who-ish. It's kind of Doctor Who-ish. Where it works within its own rules, but they don't make any sense to anybody else. I hate bigger on the inside things. They hurt my brain. Which is why I wish that I would have read these when I was a little kid, because I could have more fully appreciated that, because I didn't have, didn't have nearly as much of an issue with bigger on the inside type uh, logistics. <laughs> um, now that I'm older I feel the need to wrap my head around things, but I still totally appreciate these books. It doesn't... I don't think I appreciate them as fully as I could have as a child. I would have liked my early childhood imaginings to be shaped by these, so in that way I wish that I had read them when I was younger, but I don't at all feel that I can't enjoy them anymore. Uh, they're... <sighs> They're wonderful. I love them so much. So there's a total of five books. Besides the girl who circumnavigated Fairyland in a ship of her own making, the next one is the girl who fell beneath Fairyland and led the rebels there. Then there's the girl who soared over Fairyland and cut the moon into the boy who lost Fairyland and the girl who raced Fairyland to all the way home. I really liked all of the side characters. I like it starts out with one main character who then meets two more who become her main cohorts and I do like myself a trio and uh, they do all have their own skills that make them good at different aspects of questing type things which I also appreciate and they have very distinct personalities and they're just cute the little triad is just so cute and all the side characters are so distinct and creative and I like them a lot. Um, like, uh, things went badly for a very minor secondary plot character, uh, pair of characters at the end of this one that you hadn't even seen or heard of for two books before that, and yet it touched my heart very much and I freaked out so much until I figured out in the next book that they were fine and okay and everything was restored, and, and I just that even those little characters, those little side characters who were hardly in it, were very important to me and that's just a sub amount of how much all the all the characters were really important to me and touched my heart a lot. I loved all the side characters. The side characters were glorious and I cared about them a lot. This is one of those series where they have a very big theme of the good guys being having the bad guys having some evil inside and the good guys also um, not being so different from the bad guys as they think they are and uh, so the the main villain for the first book touched my heart a lot and oh I have feels for her. Uh, there are two books that are set before the beginning of the series that um, Catherine wrote I believe after she'd finished all of them and uh, I'm very excited to read those. I just don't haven't got them yet. And they're both surrounding that evil character, one before she's evil and one after she's evil, so I'm very excited to read that. And she's just so... 
she's so good at talking about big important topics while still being not so taking yourself seriously and that's something that I really want to do in my own writing it's about something that I love so much in other people's because it's a really good opportunity to like communicate these big important ideas to kids because these are very much aimed at kids and they're very accessible because of the reading level and the the charm and the the being very action oriented while also developing your characters very nicely as Milgrade is known for. So it makes a lot of topics like consent is talked about quite a bit um, and uh, but in a very kid friendly way where it's like just having somebody's permission before you kiss them type thing and there's stuff about power and how uh, power corrupts and how and how hurt people hurt people but also hurt people choose to hurt people and how it's still a choice even if there's a reason behind it it's still a choice and all sorts of deep stuff like that it's really glorious and like this author is like coming up to the point of bumping Emily Rada for my favorite author ever and I've and like that's unheard of for something that I read that I'm reading now as an adult that to something that has childhood nostalgia behind it that's the only thing that's keeping Emily Rada like barely on top there. and <laughs> that's crazy because I've never ever had an author do that before come since Emily Rada come up to her level of my heart <laughs> and my admiration that if uh, you have any of my taste you should definitely check out the Fairyland series by Catherine Valente. Uh, right now I'm also reading, I've gotten hold of several of her other works, like her most recently published um, space opera, and I've also got some waiting that are her old, or older works like The Bread We Eat in Dreams, I'm looking there on my floor, and um, uh, Speakeasy, and so I'll be reading those next month. You should follow her on Twitter too, because she's and she's pregnant, so that's exciting too. <laughs> oh, and her fiance is totally adorable, and oh, oh, they they tweet back and forth. And it's so cute, <laughs> and they call the baby rogue AI. I just, I just can't take it. It's so cute. Okay, next. What's next? Let's do the next fantasy book, sort of. Is this fantasy or just historical fiction? It's fantasy-ish. So this book, I have mixed feelings about this book. <clears throat> First of all, I didn't find out that it was the third in the series until I was three quarters of the way through it because, as you can see uh, from the scumminess on it, it, um, I can't get this to focus. Anyway, the number on the side is co was covered up by the library sticker when I bought it. So I didn't know. <laughs> I finally looked at that uh, when I was three quarters of the way through it and found that it's the third in the series. Which makes more sense because there were some things that had happened before this that seemed like they should have a book written about them and not just be in the history. But there were books book written about them because this is the third book. Second of all, I barely didn't DNF this right away because it starts with an action scene. And this author cannot write action scenes, at least at present. At le or, or she doesn't care about, she seems to care about action scenes, she does them a fair amount, she's interested in them, in them and how they work, but she does it badly, very badly. And fight scenes are some of the things that I really love in books. So when a fight scene is done badly, it's very disappointing. Also, starting off that way, it made it seem like all her writing would probably be really bad. It really wasn't. Action scenes, fight scenes, are the only ones that are really terrible <laughs> from this book. The rest of the scenes, like her, there's some where she's nursing her sister back to health, or other people, or there's um, talking to her mother, or uh, planning things, or having uh, corruptions go on, and things like that. Uh, those are all written just fine, and uh, but the the fight scenes are just painfully one, not knowing very much about how fighting works, particularly in this historical sense with the ninjas and the samurai, but also just with being just painfully awkward to read. 
so and this is the third book like if it was her first book she'd ever written it'd be like okay there's she's got some things to learn but clearly she's not I mean they could have possibly been even worse in the earlier books but that's there should be progress made if something's that bad <sighs> like Especially when fighting is such a major part of the series because it's all about Sisters of the Sword. It's all about these two girls who are learning to fight so that they can take back their country from their evil uncle and even survive trying to be killed by him, him trying to kill them. But I'm interested in the plot. I'm interested in the national intrigue going on. I'm interested in the characters. So I want, I think I'm going to read the other books and just kind of skim the fight scenes. Next I'm going to talk about Love in a Headscarf which I read directly after reading City of Veils because I thought why not I'll read my two uh, uh, books about Muslim women in a row so that I get kind of the contrast and can kind of think about all those things I was thinking about for City of Veils in a different context which this is once again Love in a Headscarf by Shalina Zara John Mohammed and it is a memoir and it is basically the story of how this woman goes through a journey both a personal journey and an outward journey of the different ways she looks for a partner a life partner she's a british um british muslim by the way she her um, were her parents immigrants or was it I think, I think her parents were the immigrants. I think her parents were born in East Africa and India. Her family brought a lot of that culture with them and so she's been raised in the dual cultures of... She's got East African and Indian and uh, British cultures working on her as well as uh, the Muslim religion. So she's got all those things in her history and the way she thinks about things. So we're taking through a journey of how she progresses through figuring that out and also through how she searches for a partner in different ways. So she starts off very traditionally with her Muslim family being involved in a matchmaker and the families having a big interview all together and then she gradually moves to less and less traditional ways of like asking guys out, doing online dating, uh and eventually meeting people at like Muslim events like uh, that are like conferences and things where they talk about issues and she does stuff like she goes and climbs a mountain she goes and uh, tours around the Middle East and kind of sees the the area of her religion's Orients she goes to Mecca and stuff like that and establishes herself as who she is and as an individual uh, while she's also looking for this partner and there's a lot of really interesting stuff about uh, Islam in there and I I hadn't realized that the Quran actually retold a lot of stories from the Bible I knew there was stuff about Muhammad but I didn't realize and I knew that they uh, had origins from tracing their ancestry I believe back to Abraham's other son who wasn't Isaac who was Ishmael and stuff like that but I didn't realize like that so many of the stories that I knew were in the Quran but different and reading the her retellings of the stories that I knew from childhood but the Muslim version was very trippy <laughs> um Mary did what now and, and stuff like that. It was really crazy. So uh, it was really interesting and I really did not expect to find so much I had in common with this girl. The way that we think about God and the way, I don't know, just so much of me and this woman's spirit is so similar and our how our journey, how we thought about God is so similar. It weirds me out a lot. To find any person who had that much in common with me, let alone someone who's not even from my religion. Also, I really love her color scheme choice. I have a really pretty picture and bookstagram of this one too. I love her outfit with the pink. I love it. Um, <laughs> and she actually, an interesting thing about reading it right after I read this, is that she talks a little bit about uh, the people in Ar the Muslims in Arab countries and how she feels about them being forced to wear various things whereas she is not forced she chooses to wear them as an expression of her religion 
and she also talked about something that I've been aware of, but um, as a very far from me type thing, which she talked about how Muslims were feared and mistreated after 9-11. She talked about that transition in her life before and after 9-11, how her life in public at her job and such was affected after that had happened. And she just talked about a lot about what she believed and it was really interesting. So if you would like to know more about uh, that kind of thing, uh, totally pick it up. My battery is dying so I might talk a little fast now. Uh, the next two I'm going to talk about are f collections and I have them to be, both be gold and green which is cool. Uh, this one is the Mammoth Book of Fantasy which has a bunch of short stories from people like Ursula K. Le Guin, Tanith Lee, Fritz Leiber, Theodore Sturgeon, Harlan Ellison, Michael Stanwyck, Michael Moorcock, and more and I've read several of these and they were really interesting and I'm really glad that I picked this up. Uh, I haven't read all of them, but the ones I read were weird and not your normal, not stuff I'm used to, like stuff I'm used to reading, but uh, each one has an introduction that talks about how this author in particular and also how um, how this particular story fits in with this author's the rest of their work and how this author affected the fantasy genre and how and how they were affected by it, and that was really fascinating. I really liked Ursula K. Le Guin's sh story, by the way, so I'm excited to read the rest of hers. Ursula K. Le Guin is someone I've become interested in after she died, uh, so I'm very interested to pick up the rest of her works, and I really like the one in here. If you are a writer, or not a writer, and or for some other reason are interested in the origins of the fantasy genre, totally pick it up, it's really interesting. And also, if you're a writer, you might be interested in different types of fantasy, fantasy stories that aren't what we do now, but that were a part of the journey, and you might want to pick some of those up to kind of be different from what's happening now, but something that has been done before, it might inspire you. And the Irish Fairy and Folk Tales little, little bitty book I got for my birthday from my mom. And, uh because she knows I love my Irish fairy tales, my Irish everything, and my fairy tales everything, so the combination of course is great, and uh, it's been fascinating as well. Very, several of them are familiar because I like Irish fairy tales, so I've been introduced to them before, but they're, uh, there's nothing that I full, heard the full story of before. They're just kind of familiar in a vague sort of way, like I've heard stories inspired by them, or I've heard other versions of the stories. So I'm very glad to have this, and if you're interested, you should definitely pick it up. It's good. It's basically a collection of, and they're like, the coolest thing about this is that they're in their almost original form. They're like from 100, 150 years ago. They were put in, they were collected and put in English by various people. So, and then this uh, editor has gathered together from those old sources. So, uh, they're very old and very un unchanged by various literary ways of doing things. So again, much like the Mammoth Book of Fantasy, if you are wanting to know more about other types of stories that have not been in popular culture recently, uh, this would be a good source of those. And the last thing that I've been reading, I've been rereading little bits of Court of Wings and Ruin, Court of Mist and Fury, and Uprooted. I do most months at least get into Uprooted, but these also are some very nice comfort reads that I go to when I'm just feeling, I just want to read, I don't want to read something new and have to think about it, I just want to read something comforting and beautiful. <laughs> and so I've been doing that with those. Me. And I just starting in the middle whenever, wherever I feel like, or sometimes I look for a certain scene, but on the way to that scene, I'll just run into other parts that I like, so I'll just read that. So I've had a really delightful reading month. Uh, if you've read any of these and have any thoughts, or have read any of the, read any of these authors before, but not necessarily these books, uh, I would love to hear your thoughts. And also if you have recommendations based on what you might think I think I might like or what you think might help me branch out, I'd love to know about those too, so tell me in the comments. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!